She negotiated three months due diligence with a thousand dollars deposit. This is a hell of a story. The deal itself was what is called a splitter block. People need to know, like, and trust you in order to lend you money. Rob Flux, founder and head of the Property Developer Network, is here to tell a story of how to do a massive deal with either low or no money down. The profit side of things, what she ended up walking away with, 156000 The key to make this happen is not try and force what you want onto the vendor, mm -hmm. but rather understand... If you've been thinking you need huge sums of cash to get started in property investing or property development, this is an episode you're going to be really happy that you've watched. My name's Todd Sloan. This is the Pizza and Property Podcast, and you're listening to my chat with Rob Flux. Rob Flux, how you going, mate? Not too bad, Todd. Mate, this is, um, this is a hell of a story. How are you putting a deal like that together? Which is literally the first question I've got to you, because that's pretty awesome. Uh, well, the first things first is uh, it's actually not that uncommon. I'm going to say in the 11 odd years that we've been running our community, we yeah. put real deals on our uh, on our uh, meetups every single week. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say 80% of them have some form of low or no money down. Can we, can we talk through the deal first, if that's all right? Absolutely. And then kind of how it all kind of came about, skill sets, what's needed, that sort of stuff. So what, what was the deal? So the deal itself was what is called a splitter block. Mm -hmm. So that is where there's already multiple titles on an existing, sorry, multiple lots on an existing title. Okay. And so from a legal perspective, there's an ability to just separate the titles without going through a development approval process. So that's a splitter block. Now, yep. a lot of people think they only exist in Southeast Queensland. Um, this was in Melbourne. So this is in a suburb called Rose. Bud, which is right adjacent to the ocean. Um, this one was one street away from the ocean okay, with, so with ocean views. Not quite Esplanade, but kind of pushing it yeah, almost. Correct. Yeah, yeah correct. Okay. All right. And and what did they end up doing then? So they secured this site because they, they bought it through an agent or it was off market? or It, it was bought through an agent. Uh, it went through an auction campaign and there was not many people interested in the auction campaign for a variety of reasons. One, mm -hmm. property was overgrown with trees. The house itself was run down. Um, I guess the, the timing of that was right at the start of COVID. So there was a lot of people not in the market at that point in time. There's still a lot of fear then. There's a lot of fear that yep. in the market. And so when they took it to market, nobody turned up. And so there was not a single bid at auction. And so it was a post-auction process where they identified, I guess, the current situation that that vendor was in. And that's the key to make this happen, is not try and force what you want onto the vendor, mm -hmm. but rather understand what is the vendor's needs. And so how do I put together a solution that meets their needs? What was this developer's name again? Deb. Deb. What, how did Deb bypass the agent? She didn't bypass the agent. Went through the agent the whole time. Right. So just literally like talked to the agent and said, hey, I'd like to talk to the vendors. Okay. Well, that normally no, doesn't well, go well, down very well. No, I know. There's a lot of agents that are, you know, I'm going to protect my, my patch. Yeah. And um, there's other agents that are actually cooperative and actually want to do the best thing for the vendor. Okay. All right, so she just asked the question, yep. it got a positive response. She then found out what the vendors really wanted, which was... Well, there's a couple of criteria that the vendor wanted certainty of sale. Okay. So that was super important to them. They didn't want developers terms and all those sorts of things to, to, to go through the process, but they understood their site was unique and that they had to do a few things to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, they also needed to so time to them was really important because they hadn't yet determined where they were going to go. So they wanted to know how much money they had and they mm -hmm. also needed time to then find the next place. So that would have worked out well for Deb anyway. Correct. Deb yeah. wanted to use that process to her advantage to actually change the configuration of the lots. Even though she was entitled to three, she wanted to realign the boundaries. So that allowed her the process at the time to do that process. And realigning the boundaries was what gave them all like ocean views, I'm guessing? Is that the... She had, she had a combination of things she could do. She could have spun, so it was actually three lots in mm -hmm. this instance. She could have spun them so that um, all three lots had ocean views, whereas at the moment only one of them had. Right. But what she chose to do was to split one of them off instantaneously mm -hmm. and pay down some of the debt. And on the two lots that were remaining, do the boundary realignment on those two, that gives two properties with ocean views and also allows her to keep the existing house. That kept a whole bunch of intrinsic value in the deal. So the third part of the, the need of that particular vendor, this was their principal place of residence. It was their one and only time to ch to cash in because they, I guess, were boomers. Yep. They didn't have huge amounts of savings in their retirement fund and that sort of thing. So if they could do something that got them a higher purchase price, that would mean tax-free money for them. So because they had time on their hands, Mm -hmm. Deb basically said, well, I'll pay a little bit more for the deal if you give me time because as the expression goes, time is money. And they wanted time as well. They wanted time. So it was actually in their advantage. So by identifying the need yep. and then positioning it back to them to say, well, 
actually, you want that. I could use that. Why don't we work together? Okay, but I'm still not walking to the bank saying, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Bankman, I've got this amazing deal. I've got time. Like, wh- where's, where's, how's the deposit coming about? Well, the, the first thing is she negotiated three months due diligence uh-huh. with a $1,000 deposit. Okay. Okay. Now, that $1,000 deposit, she didn't have. So she went to a family member and said, hey, can I please borrow a 1000 bucks?" That bought her three months worth of time to go through the due diligence process to actually understand what council's position would be on the boundary realignment and also to find some investors in the deal. Okay, so worst case scenario, she's got a thousand bucks that's borrowed anyway, that's basically at risk. Correct. But because it's subject to a due diligence phase, that thousand dollars isn't actually at risk because <laughs> if she cancels under the due diligence, she gets a thousand bucks back. Okay, all right. So then... The deck feels like it's a bit stacked in her favour, but she's giving so much on the other end that the vendors want, they're happy to go, yeah, okay, we'll take a bit of risk up front here. Correct. Yeah, okay. All right, so she still doesn't have any money. She's borrowed the $1,000. Uh, she's going through the due diligence phase. I mean, we can safely assume the due diligence phase passed. It started working. Yeah. How is she financing this then? You said she's looking for money partners? So in that three months, she put together what is called an information memorandum or an IM. That was basically structuring the deal, putting the deal together to say, this is the opportunity. This is the potential profit. This is how the process is going to work, the timelines, that sort of thing. And she put together a proposal that she took to some investors that she'd already pre-warmed up. And and that's super important in this process because if you just walk up to a complete stranger who doesn't know you and say, hey, can I have some cash? Mm -hmm. Their likelihood is to say no. Yeah. So people need to know, like, and trust you in order to lend you money. So she'd spent a lot of time building the rapport with people that would potentially invest in her and she was just waiting for the right opportunity to put in front of them. So when you say a lot of time, I'm assuming she's been in the network for for a while now? Yeah, she's been in the network probably three or four years, yeah. Okay, and so she's like just going to the events, talking to people, this is what I can do, that kind of thing. Correct. Okay, so eventually when Deb knocks on the door, it's not who are you. It's like, oh, yeah, well, I've I've known you for uh, several years. I know your skill set. Yeah, you demonstrate capability that you're learning a process. And and a lot of people are scared with, hey, nobody will invest in me. I've never done my first deal. Or why would somebody invest in me? That's what I'm kind of thinking. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, so again, don't make it about you. It's not about you, Todd. It's about them. So can that person spend that money wisely? Can they do the deal by themselves? The answer is no, they can't. They haven't put the time in to learn the process. They haven't put the time in to find the deal. So you're helping them with a problem that they don't know how to do. So if you make it about how do I help someone else, then people will want to deal with you. Interesting. And that's precisely what Deb did. Precisely what Deb did. Okay, so she ended up... So Because a lot of people are sitting on money mm. that are sit earning 2% in the bank and going, well, I can do better out of this. So she's got the site secured. She's gone through a DD clause. She's got $1,000 down that she's borrowed. She's found some investors. She's put together an IM. They're pretty happy with the IM. Yep. And, and she's got, what, one, two, a few people that have put money in? Well, I, I won't go to the numbers. I'll keep yep. that to, to her. But, sure. Uh, but basically, they have funded the development approval process for her. Okay. Which then allows her to add value to the property through the soft equity uplift in the value of the property going up because she's now got sites that have now got views of the of the ocean sure um she sold down one of the properties to pay down the cost so the amount of money she borrowed was much much lower Mm -hmm. and the uplift that she was going to get out of the process was going to be the reassurance for the investors to get their money back okay and how long is this this all taking this is a a, what nine month project 12 month project A, a typical subdivision project depending upon your council and jurisdiction is going to be somewhere from nine months to 18 months depending upon your council some councils are super fast some councils are pretty slow and that's from the date of signing the contract to cash in the bank. And so she ended up purchasing this for, I think technically it's not actually a million dollar deal. Was it like? No, it was uh, 999,900. <laughs> so it was $100 short of a million dollars. So you know, maybe your marketing, we'll slide. <laughs> your marketing's close, but not quite. Uh, but as far as uh, the profit side of things, what, what, what she ended up walking away with? Because this is sounding pretty extraordinary so far. Well, her share of the profit after paying all the investors back was 156000 After paying investors back. That's amazing. And, and and the time that she's put into this, this isn't like full-time job. She's working this for 12 months. This is all she's doing. This is something she's doing as well as living life. Yeah. She happened to be in 
I guess the, the retirement age. Yep. Um, That's even but, more impressive. But, but not, re- but not retired per se. So she's um, doing this in her sixties. Yeah, she was in her sixties, and she was not in a, a great financial position. She was actually living with her mum in her sixties. Um, I guess so. She was, you know, down on her luck. We can get Deb on the show, Rob. She sounds pretty awesome. I, I can, <laughs> Deb is pretty awesome, mate. Um, but it's just going to show that that anything can be done. It's not if it can be done, it's how can I do it? And and the how is all about not making it about you, mm-hmm. but making it about the other person on the other side of the transaction. What is the problem that they need to solve? Mm. The other big takeaway that I'm getting from this is, like you were saying beforehand about warming up your potential investor pool, because if you just run up to someone and go, hey, I've got this IM, I've got this deal, check me out. And it's like, sorry, who are you? And why should I trust you? No yeah. like and trust. That has to be done beforehand. Absolutely. Now, there's rhetoric out there that says if the deal is good enough, the money will come. And the answer is that's true. Mm -hmm. But only if you've put the effort in up front for people to know, like, and trust you. Because Mm -hmm. if you've got a very compressed timeline for somebody to get to know you, to understand if you're trustworthy, to understand if you've got the skills to do the job, to understand is the deal actually a deal, Mm -hmm. to review all your legal documents, to do all those sorts of things. If you've got a very compressed timeline to do that, you're going to blow most people up. So you've got to preload and get your potential investors deal ready. So you need them to understand that you're a trustworthy individual. You need them to review all your legal documents up front. And you say to them, hey, when a deal comes, we've got to act fast, right? We've got a very limited timeline. So I want you to review all the legal documents now, get all your questions and concerns out of the way before there's time pressure on the deal. This is one of the things I really like about both developing and renovating and not as a developer, I've never properly developed before, but the idea that if, if you've got a really high good yielding deal or you've got a, a high uh, deal with a probability that's really good of going up in value, like your hotspotting, so to speak, you, you can't really just on sell that the same way. But if Deb had have gotten to all this effort, putting everything together, but it turns out for whatever reason, she couldn't get the funding. If the deal was still really good, she could still end up going, hey, look, is there anyone else out here that, that we could potentially partner up with or like... And that's the key about not making it about yourself but making it about the other person. So firstly, mm. you prove it's developable. Then you prove it's profitable. Then you negotiate the terms that that vendor is willing to sell it under. Mm-hmm. Then and only then do you go, does that suit my circumstance? Mm. And if it does, you jump on it. And if it doesn't, you turn to the rest of the community who are also looking for deals. You've mm-hmm. just proven it's profitable. You've just proven that it's a great deal and you know exactly what that vendor's needing. You just find someone that's a perfect match and you'll flick it for a finder's fee. Is there anything else you want to add to this story, mate? Because I feel that there's a few people out there, that especially if they're newer to this, that have just probably had a bit of a mind equals blown moment. Is there anything else you feel that's quite valuable on this one, Rob? Yeah, the key is about controlling the property, not owning the property. Money is involved, but it doesn't have to be your money, right? So how do we stitch that together? And there's seven different ways that you can actually control a property and profit from it without actually having, I guess, a lot of money to do the process yourself. So it's working out which of those seven tools are the right one to use for that particular opportunity and not reaching into your tool bag and every time pulling out a hammer because otherwise everything starts looking like a nail. I love that saying. Yeah. I feel like that's a good teaser for another episode. Seven Absolutely. things coming now or coming soon. <laughs> Uh, Rob Flux from Property Developer Network. Thank you so much for jumping again, again on the show, mate. You're more than welcome. See you guys.